Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a delight to be here. It's my first time in Mexico to speak of, other than like a like 45 minutes in Tijuana. <laughs> <laughs> about what, 10 years ago, or right now. Right. Um, it's very different. Right. Um, <laughs> but, um, but it's a delight to be here, and I'm sort of looking forward to, to seeing more. Um, this, this talk is a part of a larger project that, that I'm on with Jeffrey Hellman on um, the notion of continuity. We both got interested in it some years ago. And uh, that led us to Aristotle, <coughs> to the relationship between points and, and the continuous. And we began developing, uh, we're not the first ones to do this, of course, but we've been developing an, an account of the continuous that um, doesn't just say continuous things, it's composed of points. Um, and then we, uh, then I kind of noted, we kind of noticed, or I did more than him, that a lot of contemporary metaphysicians get themselves all tied up in the knots as to what to say about points. And if you don't think of continuous things as composed of points, those issues are really non-issues. So, what I want to do in this talk is, about half of it, I'm going to give you a very, very brief overview of Aristotle, uh, er, er, at least some part, important parts of Aristotle's accounts of the continuous and how it differs from the kind of orthodoxy today, the Dedic and Cantor one, where you're thinking of, say, a line is just a set of points. And then uh, that'll take about half the talk, and then the other half will get into, uh, get into the metaphysics um, and I think some of the uh, sort of crazy knots that uh, those folks get themselves all tied up into. <laughs> all right, so, um, all right, so the old ortho, all right, so the Aristotle versus the new orthodoxy. Um, the Dedic and Cantor account is uh, something, it's sort of the one you all learned when you were probably, when you were in high school, that, you know, let a line is just a set of points, there's infinitely many of them, it's uncountably many. Um, that's sometimes called the classical account because the logic is classical, but uh, I don't like using that phrase because we're sort of contrasting that one with Aristotle. Right? So if anybody gets to be classical, <coughs> so I changed the word, ortho again, the old, and even the orthodox, right, should be the older thing. So I'll call it the old orthodoxy versus the new orthodoxy. And I understand that the, there are a couple of uh, um, ancient philosophers here, and that kind of scares me because I don't really know what I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, we'll do my best, and I don't, sort of don't mind getting corrected. Um, I have actually, you know, discussed this with, with, ancient, with a few ancient philosophers. All right, so first of all, common ground uh, between the Aristotelian account and the contemporary, the contemporary orthodox. So in some ways, Aristotle came remarkably close to the contemporary account, the so-called classical conception. Uh, I never got the slides quite right. I'm kind of new to work writing in tech and, uh, and uh, writing slides and and. So there's bits of this that, you know, you know I had to do this in our reading, as, as I always do, and so it didn't always work out right. Uh, Trace to Cantor and Dedekind, and especially, but it's especially in comparison with Aristotle's main opponents. Now, there wasn't anybody in antiquity who represented what's the contemporary view, uh, for reasons that had to do with infinity. But Aristotle's main opponents were on the other side of the stream. Those were the atomists, who thought that there really aren't any continuous substances, that uh, when there's like a smallest size. So, all right, so first of all, for Aristotle, so this is common ground between the contemporary account and Aristotle as opposed to Aristotle's main opponents. Uh, a continuum is infinitely divisible in the sense that it has no smallest parts. That's the main thing that the atomists rejected, at least some of them. Uh, sticking to one dimension, with, you know, the idea is that any line segment can be bisected any number of times. And the results of a bisection are two bisections, and you can bisect those and bisect those, you know, indefinitely. Uh, so that's the one piece of common ground. That, and the second is that Aristotle's continuum is Archimedean. Uh, and this has two formulations. Um, again, this is me, not, uh, not uh, it's not a quote. Let A and B be two, two finite magnitudes of the same direction, say two line segments. Then there's a natural number M such that the result of adding a to, it, M, to itself m times, a, 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 m times is bigger than b. So you can get from any size to bigger than any other one in a finite number of times, right? So there aren't any infinitesimals. So you sort of everything's infinitely divisible, but not so much that they're infinitesimals. Uh, so now here's Aristotle. Uh, by continually uh, adding to a finite quantity, I shall exceed any definite quantity. Right, that's the Archimedean principle. 
by adding to one, I can pass, I can surpass any other one. In Euclid, uh, now Euclid, of course, came a bit after Aristotle, but it's generally agreed that uh, all of the mathematics at the time of Euclid were all available to Aristotle and Plato, and they were all sort of, uh, and they had all bought it. Right. Uh, unlike the opponents, the atomists, who right, didn't buy the geometry of the time. All right, so in Euclid, the, the Archimedean principle is kind of a definition. Uh, magnitudes are said to have a ratio to one another, that's what he's defining, what it is for two magnitudes to be in ratio, uh, ratio which are when capable when multiplied of exceeding one another. Yeah, the same idea. Take the smaller one, multiply it enough times, and you'll be bigger than the bigger one. Uh, the second one, uh, so that's the first formulation of the Archimedean property. It has to do with, with getting things bigger. The second one has to do with getting things smaller. <coughs> so if you start with two finite magnitudes, and take the bigger one and take away at least half of it, and then take away at least half of that, and then half of that, and half of that, and so on, eventually you'll get something that's smaller than the other one. Right. Uh, now the ancient Greek mathematicians made brilliant use of this. The method of exhaustion, right, all sort of dies on this, and they were able to use this to figure out the uh, areas of curved figures and stuff like that. Right. Um, all right, so here's Euclid on the same thing. Uh, I couldn't get this all on one slide, mostly because I hadn't quite figured out how to do slides yet. Uh, two unequal magnitudes being set out. If from the greater there be subtracted a magnitude greater than its half, and from that, which is left, a magnitude greater than its half. And if this process is repeated continually, there will be left some magnitude less than the lesser magnitude set out, right, smaller than the other one. Now Euclid proves this from the first Archimedean principle, that is the definition, um, and using also some properties of unequal magnitudes. Uh, so I mentioned the method of exhaustion earlier. Um, all right, so those, that's common ground. So the common ground between the contemporary Dedekind and Cantor account and the ancient one, the Aristotelian one, is infinite divisibility and the Archimedean property. The differences, of course, are more important for us today. Uh, to put it an, uh, anachron anachronistically, uh, Aristotle argues that, oh, so Aristotle made an argument at the time that everybody in this debate seems to have bought. And the argument is that time, space, and motion all have the same structure. Um, and all, Aristotle and his opponents all, all agreed to this. The idea is that, well, the argument is that since motion just is movement in time through space, right? so if one of these is composed of points, then so are the, so are, <coughs> are the other two. If one of them is not, if the atomists are right about one of them, then the atomists are right about all three. And if the Euclideans or Aristotelians are right about one of them, then, then they're right about all three. So all three have the same structure, time, space, and motion. Um, all right, so if one of those is punctiform, that is, if it's composed of points, then so are the other ones, or if one is composed of atoms, so are the other ones. All right. uh, <coughs> contemporary metaphysicians haven't bought this, but uh, sometimes they'll talk about time being one way and space being a different way. Right, but, all right, now, um, probably the most central feature of the Aristotelian account of the con is the continua concerning all three, time, space, and motion are not composed of points. For Aris all right, so for continua, continua are not punctiform. That's just another phrase for being composed of points. The parts of a line segment, then, all right, so for Aristotle, as for Euclid, lines are always lines, what we call line segments today, right? No infinitely long lines. Today. So the parts of a line segment are just other line segments. Uh, in, the, in the jargon of contemporary metaphysics, continua for Aristotle are gungy, right? No smallest part. Now, Michael White um, uh, attributes the following principle of non supervenience to Aristotle. And here's sort of part of the argument why Aristotle thinks that continua can't be composed of points. Each partition of a continu that's, that's a typo. Each partition of a continuous magnitude into proper parts yields parts, each of which is pairwise continuous with at least one other part. So the principle that Aristotle is putting forward here is that if you have a continuous thing, say a line or a chunk of space or something, and you divide it up into parts, any two of those, there'll be two of the, any one of those parts will be next to another one. That's what he means by continuous. You don't get that in the um, Dedekind Cantor account. Right? You divide up a line into points, right? it's not the case that each of those points is next to another one. Right? Right? So, um, 
So for Aristotle, as for Euclid, as for the contemporary mathematicians, between any two points, there's a line segment, right? Right. So there won't be a point next to it. Right? Now, so as Aristotle puts it, that which is intermediate between points is always a line, and that which is intermediate between moments is a period of time. Uh, the word moments there, again, I don't know Greek, but uh, the word that he uses uh, for moments is actually now, and, and it's sometimes translated that way. He calls them a, a, like a, an instant in time, a now. But a moment is, I think, a better, you know, at least. You know, as we can do. So no two points. So by the principle of non-supervenience, no two points can be continuous. Oh no, no two points can be continuous with each other. So it follows from the principle of non-supervenience that you can't divide up a line, you can't partition a line into points, into point size pieces. And this, of course, is where Aristotle parts company with the contempt. Well. The anachronism put it that way. You can't part company if you didn't know them. But this is where the Aristotelian right, parts company with the contemporary Dedekind Canon. Right now, Aristotle, though, unlike some of the more modern gunky accounts of space and space time, uh, does recognize points. Uh, and points are crucial to his views on continuity and, and in decomposability. We won't get into decomposability, but they're crucial to his views on continuity. Um, for, first and foremost, for Aristotle, points are the limits or endpoints of line segments. So it isn't that a line is composed of points. All a point is is the end point of a, is the end of a line segment. So each line segment will have two endpoints. That's it, first and foremost. That's sort of the primary definition. So each point is somehow metaphysically tied to the line segment that it's a point of. Um, the, now there are points interior to a line too. Uh, but those only exist potentially, not actually. So if you take a line segment and look at a point inside of it, say the midpoint, uh, that's a place where the line could be divided. Right? That's why it exists only potentially. But unless the line is divided there, if you bisect it, you know, all the Euclid say, then that point doesn't exist. It's only there potentially. Right. Now, and, and Aristotle sort of comes to this well, there's a bit of dispute among scholars here, and if they have disputes, then I'm not allowed to have an opinion. But uh, most of them think that um, Aristotle comes to this view of points because he's thinking about Zeno's paradoxes, right, which sort of rocked the ancient world. Right? So, uh, so here's one of them. <coughs> so consider an instance of Zeno's paradox of division. Suppose that you have someone, Ms. Walker, she wishes to cover a distance of 100 meters. All right, now, go from here. All right, now before she can do that, she has to cover half that distance. So she has to walk 50 meters first. Call that walk one. So she has to take walk one first. Then she has to walk the next 25 meters. Right. Walk two. Call that walk two. Then the next 12 and a half meters. Right. Walk three. And so on. Right. So then Zeno concludes that in order to reach her destination, she has to do an infinite number of walks. And Zeno concludes from that that she can't do that. And so the motion is impossible. This is the first time, you know, you have a philosopher come, well, it probably is one of the first times, but we have a lot of times since then where a philosopher sort of tells you something that we know from common sense is, you know, <laughs> so he says, emotion is impossible, change is impossible, right? It's all an illusion. <laughs> uh, now, of course, Aristotle, unlike Plato, is really going to be the defender for the most part of common sense, so he's going to have to find something wrong with this argument. Um, I mean, we find something wrong with it today, too, but not the same thing that Aristotle found. All right, so Aristotle, of course, follows common sense, and he disagrees with Zeno's conclusion. And his view on points that I sketched before plays a central role in that, right? And so what's wrong with uh, Zeno's reasoning? Consider the end point of walk one, right? So remember, Ms. Walker starts off and goes 50 meters, and we call that walk one. And consider the, that, the point there, right, in space where she stops. Or no, so I gave it away. Consider the point at the end of the 50 meters. Um, that's a place where she could stop, where she could pause her journey, either temporarily or permanently. That's what it means to say that the point exists potentially. She could stop there. And there are infinitely many places, Aristotle recognizes, where she could stop, right, in anywhere along the 100 meters. Uh, but unless she does stop there or somewhere else, there's no separate walk one to consider. There's just the single event, the 100 meters, the walk of 100 meters. That walk is not the sum of walk one, walk two, walk three, you know, and so on. All right, so that's the one difference. Now, I realize there are versions of uh, Zeno's paradoxes that this doesn't solve, that Aristotle didn't know about those, and Zeno didn't either. And, you know, but we can get to that later if, you know, if anybody wants. 
All right, so that's one. So that's uh, Aristotle on points. Next is his Aristotle on continuity and contiguity. So that's a distinction he makes between the contiguous and the continuous. I don't know if, what the, if there's. Um, I mean, that's a distinction in English. In English, those are more or less synonyms, but it, it, you know, it's a translation of two Greek words that. Um, uh, and it's, an, it's a distinction Aristotle is making, right? He's just using the two words, right, to make it. Uh, so, dis, so here it's the discrete from the continuous. It's that distinction, right? So discrete are number and language. Continuous are line, surfaces, bodies, and besides, and also besides these, time and place. Remember, time, space, and motion are all going to have to have the same structure, right? For the parts at which, oh, so let's go back to number. Now, for number for Aristotle is always number of something, right? And it's a natural number here, like 5 or 12 or something. But it's, it's going to be not a number as a Platonic entity. I mean, Aristotle wasn't a Platonist, you know, duh, right? But, um, <laughs> but uh, it's always numbers of things, right? So it would be number of sheep, number of people, right? All right, so when it says number, it's always means number of something. So the parts of number, say, <coughs> five sheep, have no common boundary at which they join together. Right? You just have the five sheep. Right? Uh, nor could you ever, in the case of number, find a common boundary of its parts, but they're always separate. Right? Say the people in this room, they're always separate. Now, of course, they could be touching, holding hands or something, but they don't have to be. Um, uh, hence, number is one of those discrete quantities. So number is, is on the discrete side. Similarly, language, this is interesting, uh, is also one of the discrete quantities. Now, by language, he means spoken language here. For its parts do not join together at any common boundary. For there is no common boundary at which the syllables join together. Each is separate in itself. All right, that's discrete. Now we do continuous. A line, on the other hand, is a continuous quantity. For it is possible to find a, com for it is possible to find a common boundary at which its parts join together. All right, remember. So if you take two line segments that are next to each other, Right? There is a common boundary where they join together, the, the point. Right? There's a point there that's the left end point of the one of them and the right end point of the other one. All right, so I already did this about numbers are always numbers of things, and a line was what we think of as a line segment. So when two segments join together, there's a common boundary, right? the point right? That, that connects them. Right? Now, in, now, here's the con the con con contiguity. In Book 5 of the Physics, he defines two things to be contiguous if they're next to each other in such a way that nothing can be between them. Right? So things are said to be in contact. That's another phrase for contiguous, in contact, that he uses. Right? Things are said to be in contact when their extremities are together. Right? So I've checked this with, uh, actually, uh, the uh, main, my main source on this when I, when I get into this, uh, stuff on Aristotle, especially when logicians tell me that I'm getting it wrong is I talked to my colleague at St. Anne's, Sarah Brody, and, and she liked this example. So think of a pair of uh, books on, a, on a tight, adjacent books on a tightly packed shelf right? as an example of things in contact or contiguous. They're, they're so close together that nothing can get between them. Right? But there's still two of them. That's why it's contiguous. Right? Um, right, and a thing is in succession when it is after... Oh, I don't think we need this. Um, all right, so, so two things are in succession if they're in one after another and nothing of the same kind can be between them. Right, that's what this quote is. Two things are contiguous if they're one after the other and nothing is between them. So if you think of like a row of, of houses right, on a street, right, those would be in succession because there's no houses between you know, neighboring ones. But, uh, but they're not contiguous because there is space, well, at least, you know, depending on how the street is set up. But, um, you know, if there's like a yard or something between them, then they're not contiguous. They're contiguous if nothing is between them, can, be, can get between them. Um, okay. Now he, now he goes on to define what's continuous, right? The, the target, the thing we're after. So he defines it as a relation between two things. The continuous is just what is contiguous, that is this property of being next to each other with nothing can get between. Uh, but I say that a thing is continuous when the extremities at which they are in contact become one and the same, and are, as the name implies, contained in each other. So 
so things are continuous with each other. When they, when they come next to each other, the boundary disappears and becomes merely potential. Uh, so this definition, oh, so getting back to Aristotle, this definition makes it plain that continuity belongs to things that naturally, in virtue of their mutual contact, form a unity. Right? So if something's continu continuous, then it's naturally a, a unit. There's something holding it together. That's also something we don't have in the contemporary account. Right? A line just is a set of points. There's nothing holding it together. Right? No unity there. All right, so the aforementioned books right, on a shelf right, are not continuous because no matter how close they get to each other, right, they still, each one has its own boundary. Right? The boundary of this one is different from the boundary of the other one. Uh, even when contiguous, they remain two books. In contrast, when two continuous things, such as line segments, come into, come into contact, the boundary between them is absorbed and they become a single line. Now, Sarah liked it. This is my example. I'm kind of proud of it. Sarah liked it. Um, for a more physical Sarah Brody, that is, you know, uh, probably one of the foremost Aristotle scholars in the world. So I think this is kind of cool. So if somebody tells me I got it wrong, then right, right, right. So for a more physical example, think of what happens when you leave two chunks of wet dough to rise before being baked to bread. I mean, baked into bread. This happens to me all the time. It used to happen when I used to bake bread. When you, you put them down to rise, and they're, you leave them too close together. Right? So then they rise until they come in, into where they're contiguous with each other. But then the boundary disappears, and they become one, one loaf. All right, now, uh, in book six of the physics, Aristotle summarizes these definitions and sounds of things that motivates, well, the present project, I don't mean the one I'm talk, well, talking about today, but the one with, uh, with Helen. If, now, now, if the terms continuous in contact, or contiguous, and in succession are understood as defined above, Things being continuous, if their extremities are one, right? that's the wet dough, or the line segments. In contact, if their extremities are together, right? the box. Right? And in succession, if there's nothing of their own kind intervening between them. Nothing that is continuous can be composed of indivisibles. Right? That's the conclusion. Nothing that is continuous, where its parts are continuous with each other, can be composed of indivisible things like points. They all have to be gunky, right, in the contemporary metaphysical sense. Um, a line cannot be composed of points, the line being continuous and the point indivisible. One other thing, again, I'm not a, a scholar here, maybe some of you are that can help me, but I don't know why Aristotle would bother saying this because I don't know of anybody in the ancient world that held that. Right? I mean, you know, if Dedekind and Cantor had sort of gone back in time and were hanging around and doing it, then he would have had an opponent, right? right? But uh, no one held this, but Aristotle, again, is making a big deal of it. It could be that Zeno's kind of presupposing it, or he's sort of attributing it, if you like that, to Zeno, or he's claiming that that's Zeno's mistake, right, or something like that. But again, but that's not, you know, so much for, uh, for present concern. All right, so these views on continuity, so it's these views on continent. oh, I don't, yeah, all right, so I'll just summarize this. So, the, the a, a common theme about continuous things that is lost on the, that we don't have on the Dedekin Cantor account, is that continuous things can't be broken up cleanly into parts. And Aristotle holds that, for, but for different reasons than uh, you know, others do, say the modern intuitions. For Aristotle, if you, if you take something continuous and break it into parts, you're actually creating something new, or actually two new things. So if I take a line and break it up, I'm creating two new things, the two endpoints. Right. Um, for most uh, contemporary people, like the intuitionists who hold a similar view to this, when you break it up, you lose something. You know, the way they put it is that when you cut it, something will stick to the knife. Right? <clears throat> but for Aristotle, you're also getting that it can't be broken up cleanly, but for different reasons. Or think about the wet dough. If you, break it, if, you, if you sort of take a loaf and break it in half, you're creating two new things, the two new surfaces. Okay. Um, all right, so this is a summary. For as soon as bodies come into contact or divided, the boundaries simultaneously become one if they touch. That's if they're continuous. So the boundaries become one if they touch, and two if they're divided. Hence, when the body's been put together, one boundary does not exist, but has ceased to exist. And when they've been divided, the boundaries exist, which did not exist before. Right? The boundaries were only there potentially. Okay, done. we don't need to get into Aristotle's stuff on infinity, um, because uh, it's a distraction and uh, not so relevant here. But, I mean, well, it's relevant to the Aristotle bit because 
uh, he doesn't think that there are any actual infinite, actually infinite sets. That's, that's another thing that we don't have today with the Dedekind Cantor count. You're thinking of the line as an actual infinity of points. Right? So these are obviously connected, but, it's, but now what I need to do is get to the other slides. Um, so now I'm going to show my dexterity with Max. Um, Alright, same title, but different time. No, no, so now I'll switch gears. Now we're sort of on contemporary uh, the analytic metaphysics. Okay, how am I doing? Right. So, about right, right, about halfway? Yeah, okay, good, that's perfect. Okay. All right, so now, contemporary uh, metaphysician, analytic metaphysicians have occupied themselves with the nature of, or the possible nature of space and time, and with the relationship between physical objects and the regions of space or time they occupy. Some of the issues concern the boundaries of objects and the notion of contact. I and mean, that's sort of a big topic today, right? Much but, not, much but not all, but most of it, of the, of the literature, the metaphysical literature, just assumes the Dedekind Cantor account of space. Right? They just assume that space is composed of points, and then they kind of wonder what do we have to do about point-sized objects and stuff like that. Uh, many authors get tangled up over what to say about point-sized regions, right? points in space, that is. Um, and even point-sized objects, as we'll see. The purpose of this paper, or of the rest of the talk, is to give a somewhat biased overview of some of this literature. I've been told by people who don't like it that it's not the best of it, but that's just the way it is with metaphysics. <coughs> Nobody likes whatever, you know. <laughs> that's, that's what I right, um, arguing that many of the issues are much easier to negotiate if you don't, if you don't, if we assume a more Aristotelian account of space. It isn't that you can't define points, you can't. I mean, in, you know, as we know, you can always take an Aristotelian account and put the points in as limits. Right? So it isn't like you're losing anything right, by doing this. And we'll, uh, well, I don't know if we will today, but we'll also brief, uh, briefly broach the question of whether space or space-time really is punctiform. Right? I think, I'm, I don't know if I'm willing to defend this, but I think that that's a verbal dispute. Um, but again, we sort of talked a lot about verbal disputes with the first talk, so. Uh, but we probably won't get to it. All right, now, first of all, what's going on in the metaphysical literature? What exactly are they talking about? All right now, most metaphysicians are aware of the fact that physical objects in the actual world, if there are any, uh, do not have the sort of boundaries envisioned by in their metaphysical theorizing. I mean, they know that the world isn't like that, right? like what they're envisioning. Mm -hmm. um, some, all right, they know, at least when they were in college, they took some physics, and, you know, and they, so they know that, that objects don't have sharp boundaries, that they knew any quantum mechanics, and they... Right, and um, they know about repulsive forces that keeps objects from actually touching and stuff like that, right? Uh, but still, they're, all right, so now what are they doing? Uh, now some of it, right, well, I, I think that's an interesting question, right? Uh, and sometimes they address it. Some of it takes itself to be exploring logical space. That is, they're asking what boundaries of contact are like or would be like in those possible worlds where physical objects do have precise locations and where objects do come into contact with each other. As noted, uh, members of this group, most of them anyway, are fully aware that the actual world is not one of those worlds, but they profess interest in these other worlds. Or better, I mean, a more sober way to put it is that they're interested in, in logical relationships between various species. This is true. All right, now, a second orientation uh, is, the, all right, so that's the first one. It's sort of exploring logical space, right, for, the, for, for this metaphysics project. The second one is that our questions are addressed in what Strassen calls descriptive metaphysics. So this is the project of, quote, capturing the actual structure of our thought about the world. Right? So they know that the world isn't that way, but how do we think about the world? Uh, descriptive metaphysics aims to, quote, this is Strassen, to lay bare the most general features of our conceptual structure and not to revise this conceptual structure, and presumably not to figure out how the world really is. Right, right now, whose thought are they talking about here? Whose conceptual structure is the meta descriptive metaphysician after? As above, it's not that of the scientist or the scientifically informed layperson, certainly not Manny's second philosopher. I mean, that character, oh, I don't know, I, that character uses whatever she can get from all of the sciences to try to figure out what the world is like. The script the metaphysician isn't doing that. So what is he doing? Figuring out what our thought is, that how do we think about the world? What's our conceptual scheme, right? the everyday one, not the one that we get from our science classes, assuming that there is such a thing. Now, John Hawthorne uh, uh, you know, presents a thought experiment. I won't go in, into it too much. 
involving an infinite series of walls placed parallel to each other in a finite amount of space. So it's kind of a xenotype thing. You've got one wall here and then another one that's half as thin, but a little space between them, another one that's a quarter thin space between them, and so on. So there's infinitely many. Um, and so all but a few of the walls are really thin, really thin. Uh, and he, but then he anticipates, and then he kind of does this thought experiment. Well, if you kind of walk up to this thing, what keeps you from bashing into it? All right. Puzzle, right? Interesting. All right. Now, then, he, then he, he notes that some people may complain that this isn't really all that interesting. Some may complain that, that the world he's talking about here, the situation, is too distant to be worth interest in, being interested in. Actual walls do have extra repulsive forces, don't get to be rigid and impenetrable at any thickness, and so on. So some people might claim, well, that just can't happen in this world, so why are we bothering with it? Such a reaction is far too hasty, Clawthorne says. This distant worlds can often be either revealing or therapeutic with regard to our actual conceptual scheme. Right. So the idea is that you can, by thinking about those things, we can figure out how we think, whoever we is. Right? To me, this is one of the most wrong-headed things that's ever been written in philosophy. <laughs> right. So that's sort of combining the, the two approaches, sort of by thinking about logical space, these sort of really wacky worlds, then we learn what our conceptual scheme is like. All right, so anyway, that's the preliminary, right? What their, uh, what their sorts of questions are up to. They're usually not all that explicit about it, right? Hawthorne is uh, one of the more usual ones who is sort of upfront about it. All right, so now our first batch of questions concerns boundaries and contact. So it's common to define a receptacle, this is a technical term, to be a chunk of space. I should, um, and I don't want to keep saying space or space time, so I'm just going to use space from now on, but if you can do this four dimensionally, it's not going to change anything. So a receptacle is a chunk of space that a physical object can exactly occupy. So our first and primary question in, you know, in, this, in this branch of metaphysics concerns just which chunks of space are receptacles. Now on a regions-based account of space, an Aristotelian one, a natural thesis would be that any region is a receptacle. Or maybe. Or if you don't want... Um, that would certainly be, be make sense for Aristotle because he just thinks of region just as the things that occupy, you know, the chunks of space that uh, that um, objects can occupy. If you don't want scattered regions, then don't allow those. You know, but all this could be. But it, so a natural answer to this from the Aristotelian point of view is that any region is a receptacle. Uh, but now on the more now standard Dedekind and Cantor accounts, regions just are sets of points. So the task at hand is to figure out which sets of points are receptacles, right? which sets of points can contain objects. Once we decide or figure out what receptacles are, then we have to have something to say about what the boundaries of objects are, if they have boundaries, and what it is for objects to be in contact with each other. So that's the game. Right? Right. Now, um, now thinking sort of Dedekind Cantor, as we all do, right? Dedekind Cantor world, where all we have is, is, uh, is sets of points. Can we really make physical sense of, say, two ice cubes? One that contains its boundary and one that doesn't. And so if you know a little math, one is open and one is closed. Uh, can you really think that there are two different ones? One has its boundary, one doesn't. Um, Aristotle, obviously, that would be silly. The boundaries aren't really separate from the thing, right? But again, from the Dedekind Cantor point of view, maybe that's a legitimate question, right? right? Well, perhaps there are different kinds of objects, some of which contain their boundaries and some which don't. Questions like these become pressing if you think of space as composed of points in the now standard Dedekind Cantor manner. Right. Now, Hudson, uh, so he's my first target, he argues that any non empty set of points can be receptible. This is the most radical right. and crazy. Uh, <laughs> thus, he envisions point sized objects. So he, said he envisions it's possible that there can be an object which is a point or occupies a point in space. Um, Scattered objects whose receptacles are finite or countably infinite sets of points, objects in three space that are plain squares and so on. And so he envisions objects whose receptacles are open and some whose receptacles are closed. Right? So he does have, in his metaphysics, the possibility of the open cube and the closed one. And then he goes on to try to figure out what, what it is for objects to be in contact. And he goes through a bunch of thought experiments and he comes up with this definition here. The idea is that one object touches another one, just in case there's two regions. The first one occupies the first region, the second one occupies the second region, 
there's a point in the first region, a point in the second region, and there's a, there's a boundary point of each of those regions, and that's, and the boundary point belongs to exactly one of the objects. Right. So then, two open, well, we'll get to that. Right. But anyway, it doesn't matter, the details of that don't matter too much. Right. Then he articulates a knot. Now that's his phrase, right? So again, I'm not attributing to this to him, this is what he, what he says. He articulates a knot for which he has no satisfying resolution by his own lights. So again, you don't have to really digest it as a kind of contact. I'll go over the relevant bits of it in a second. All right, so notice first that on Hudson's view, certain kinds of objects simply can't touch each other. All right, so think about, so we had our, an ice cube that, didn't include, that doesn't include its boundary, and take another ice cube that also doesn't include its boundary. Right? Those two cannot touch each other. Because for, in order to touch each other, you need to have a boundary point that's part of one and not part of the other, but neither one of them contains its boundary point. So two open, open, it's open in a topological sense, right? Can't touch, can't, can't come into contact. All right. Also, this is the more interesting one from this point of view. Two closed objects can't come in, come into contact either. So imagine two cubes that both include their boundaries. Those can't come into contact for Hudson because if they did, they would have to share their boundary. And he thinks that two objects, at least certain kinds of objects, can't interpenetrate. They can't share anything. And so that's not possible. So it's not possible for an open object and two open objects to touch each other because they, neither one has, a, has its boundary points. And it's not possible for two closed objects to touch each other because the boundaries can't, uh, the objects can't overlap. All right, now here's the nine. All right, so suppose that two closed cubal, cubical objects are moving towards each other at a constant velocity. So we've got two cubes, ice cubes say, both that contain their boundaries and they start moving towards each other uh, at a constant velocity. Um, and suppose they're oriented so a side of one of them is parallel to a side of the other one. Right. So they're, they're headed to contact. Um, suppose they start at exactly five meters from each other. Oh, that's a typo here. One of them moving at one meter per second relative to the other. All right. Now what happens as you get close to the five second limit you know, when they're about to come into contact? Uh, the objects cannot end up touching, because, on his view, because uh, they can't, right? They can't touch. They can't overlap, right? All right. Uh, but no matter how close they get, they can always get closer. Um, so what happens? All right. So of course, in the actual world, uh, no no object can occupy a closed region, right? We know that from physics. Matter of fact, no 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 object occupies again. My quantum mechanics is rusty. There's different interpretations of it, but generally, no object occupies any region sharply. What you have is a probability density that fades off, and those can't overlap. Right. All right. Uh, all right. Moreover, all right. The particles that make up each object, and even if we, even if the world was more Newtonian, the the op, the the particles that make up the object have repulsive forces, so they can't come into contact either. Right. But again, we're not dealing with those worlds. We're dealing with this, you know. All right. Uh, but here we're supposedly exploring metaphysical <laughs> possibilities. So now Hudson explains what the, what the problem is, what the knot is. With the exception of pairing a closed object with an open object, that one would work, by the way. Right? So if I have a closed cube and an open one, they fit together exactly. Right? So that's fine. Right? But anything else is not fine. Right? All right, any other pairing can be so oriented that both interpenetration, you know, where they share some, some of their regions, uh, and touch it. and uh, touching are not objects. The items paired must either slow down, jump, stop, turn, or otherwise deviate from their courses. Given the discussion above, if you buy it all, we can clearly explain that such deviant behavior will occur, but just what explains why. Why must approaching objects change speed or direction? I don't know. That's, not right. uh, that's why the title of this section advertises a knot rather than a knot untied. All right, so that's Hudson. All right now, no, I don't know of anybody that has the, that radical view of uh, of receptacles that he does. But the problem that he raises, the knot, I think, is a problem for lots of views. Achille Barze, uh, you know, was uh, a nice mathematically informed instance of descriptive metaphysics. I think that's what he claims that he's doing. Uh, focuses on matters of contact and boundaries. So he's wondering what contact is like and what boundaries are like in our conceptual scheme. 
Um, all right, the world of everyday experience is mostly a world of physical things separated in various ways from their environment. Right? The observation is correct. Aristotle accommodates it well, I think. Uh, things with surfaces, skins, cross boundaries of some sort. Right? Objects generally have boundaries, surfaces. These may not always be sharply defined, sometimes, like clouds. It's not clear just what the boundary is. But other times it seems okay. Generally, boundaries seem to belong to the palette of basic ontological tools, which, which we commonly describe the middle-sized reality of ordinary experience. All right. Oh, this is a long quote. Uh, I don't think I need the rest of it. All right. So um, much of Barzi's article, right, going on to the, uh, to the bottom of this page, is a response to what he calls Peirce's puzzle. I don't know if there's any Peirce scholars here. I don't know if Peirce ever discussed this or what he had to say about it. All right, but anyway, here's the puzzle, as far as he puts it. What color is the line of demarcation between a black spot and a white background? You measure a piece of paper, right, with a black spot on it, and then what, what color is the boundary of the spot? It takes that to be a real question. Um, that's what I think so Aristotle will answer it. Dumb question. The boundary is, is just part of the spot, right? You know, so the boundary is part of the spot, right? To that extent, it's, it's black. But it's also part of the, uh, the, bound, you know, the, the, uh, the background. To that extent, it's, it's black. But he's, Aristotle would insist that the boundary isn't this separate thing, right? You have to attribute to one or the other, right? But anyway, but Aristotle was not in the dedicated canter picture, you know, trapped in that like Barzi seems to be. Um, all right, take any entity X. Again, this is, uh, this is another quote from Barzi. Uh, does the boundary belong to X or to the complement of X? Does the boundary inherit the properties of the object or those of its complement? In a way, if you think about the science of this thing, it's, it's you know, I mean, a boundary is like a point. Points can't have color. All right, but, all right. All right, Bar Barzi argues that at least some instances, all right, now he argues that at least some cases, the answer to the person's puzzle is straightforward. Again, in our conceptual scheme. We may find good reasons to maintain that uh, material bodies such as stones or soap bars are the owners of their boundaries. So if you think of like a stone or a bar of soap, right, natural to think that the boundary belongs to the soap and not to the air. Right? Thus, where the complement meets an object of this sort, it will be open. In the, you know, in the, uh, that is, when the air meets the soap, right, the air is open and the soap is closed. We may also argue that material bodies such as holes are not the owners of their boundaries. Now think of like a donut. Right? The hole of the donut, right, doesn't own its boundary. The boundary belongs to the donut. Uh, these belong to the, uh, thus where the two meet, the complement is closed and the entity open. That is, the complement is the air, right, the hole, and the object is the donut, that's open. No, the entity is the hole, that's open. And the and the, the donut is closed. All right. Now there are some analogs of Hudson's not here. Uh, imagine two objects, both of which include their boundaries. Say a baseball and a bat. Right? Pitchers and catchers reported yesterday, so this is uh, this is quite relevant. Right. All right. So consider two objects uh, that that both include their boundaries intuitively. Remember he said bars of soap, right? Include their boundaries. Rocks do. So presumably so do baseballs and so do bats. Now suppose the ball is thrown toward the bat, the bat is swung and makes contact with the ball, and then goes off to the outfield. Right? Now when that happens, at the moment of contact, what happens to the boundary of the ball and the bat? Right? Uh, it follows from a suggestion that Varzi makes elsewhere, that, I mean later on in the article, that what, what, what happens then is that at least one of the boundaries gets pushed aside so that the other one can fit in there. Right? Now, he, um, he concedes that some of the issues are difficult, but he suggests that this is not due to the notion of contact. Oh, here's another example. Uh, I, I don't know if I skipped it or if it's in the slides. Uh, so again, so think of like, uh, like a bar of soap again, and we'll assume with Farsi that it does include its boundary. And then think of a body of water, right, and, you know, uh, like, like a lake, and, and we'll assume that that includes its boundary. Or if you want, it doesn't matter. You can think of the boundaries belonging to the air, right? But think of the water. Now, we, we, we put the soap on the water and it floats. Now, the water is closed and the soap is closed. So how can, you know, so what goes on there? And again, Barzi's view would be that the boundary of one or the other of them gets pushed aside so that the other one boundary can fill it in. All right, now part of the problem here, right, that I think Barzi is getting into, and it's certainly part of the problem that I think Hudson's getting into, 
is that he's thinking, they're thinking that the boundary of a closed object is made up of the same kind of stuff as the rest of the object. That's why, Bar that's why Hudson thinks that you can't have interpenetration. Because he's thinking of the boundary as the same kind of stuff, as composed of the same kind of stuff as the inside of the object. Now, some metaphysicians, obviously we're not on the contemporary scene anymore, uh, uh, with, with Suarez, you know, 16th, 15th, 16th century. Uh, Brentano, all right, that's, well, 1988, but, you know, but that's just when, when the thing was published, or the, the thing that I took it from was published. Brentano would have been <coughs> late 19th century. Uh, and Chisholm, now he's more or less contemporary. Uh, now, they hold that every extended three-dimensional object has a boundary consisting of point-sized parts. Right, so they claim that every three-dimensional object has a boundary that's composed of point-sized parts, the boundary is, um, and such that two objects are in contact with each other when they share their boundaries. Right, so he, they, he, they don't buy, those three don't buy the Hudson view that they can't interpenetrate. They can, two objects can share their boundaries. And that's how he would solve the problem of the, the soap floating on the water. It shares, they, they share their boundaries. Right? Now, Suarez and Brentano, at least, not quite sure about Chisholm, uh, held that, as Zimmerman put it, the three-dimensionally extended parts of the thing are not made up out of indivisibles alone, points alone, but also contain some atomless gunk. Right? So the metaphysical picture they have is that, is that the boundary consists of these point-sized things, and there's also some gunky stuff in the middle. The, 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 fills the object. Uh, the boundary points of different objects can coincide, right, like the soap on the water, uh, but the internal butt parts can't. The gunky stuff can't. Um, but the interior gunker parts can't coincide. Okay. Now that resolves Hudson's knot, or at least that much it is, does. Um, but there are further problems now for this view. Problems that the three of them have uh, addressed, that is, Suarez, uh, Brentano, and, and, and Chisholm addressed. Um, the, the reason why it resolves Hudson's knot is that, yeah, they, they actually come into contact because their boundaries are overlapping, but they don't have to worry about the contact going any further because the gunky stuff is going to keep them from uh, interpenetrating any more than that. All right, now consider any cubable object, say an ice cube. I don't know why I hung up on that, um, especially given how cold it was in a while. Uh, but, all right, now there's a plane surface within the object that separates the left half from the right half. Right, so take any, any cubicle object and think about a plane that's sort of down the middle of it. According to uh, Suarez, Brentano, and Chisholm, that plane is an interior boundary to the object. Uh, and it uh, also consists of point-sized parts. Indeed, there are point-sized uh, parts located everywhere inside the object along every plane that can divide the object. Presumably, there are continuum many such interior potential boundaries. Right. You know, if you bring in the contemporary, uh, Suarez wouldn't have known about it, but the others would. Well, maybe not Brentano. Certainly, uh, Chisholm would have known about it, right? That there, uh, that, that's how many interior boundaries there have to be. Uh, and for at least Suarez and Brentano, that in fact, all these internal boundaries, these pointy things inside of it, that's an addition to the gunky stuff. So it's kind of crowded right, inside the ice cube. Right. Now, now, how many? Now take a point inside the ice cube. How many interior boundary points are there at that point? Right? Now uh, Suarez held just one. Uh, and Zimmerman argued, points out, Dean Zimmerman points out that this thesis is awkward and even has preposterous consequences. The idea that there's just one boundary point inside the object at each inter interior boundary. Uh, now it's because suppose our cubical object is cut along that plane. Now we've got two. Right? Where do the boundaries of the new part come from? Right? Well, they had to have come from the one we cut, right? But there's only one point there. Right? Uh, so the separated parts, so where do the point size parts of the two faces come from? Uh, I think uh, Suarez's view was that the original boundary is destroyed when you do that and two new boundaries are created. All right, now Brentano and Chisholm held instead that each now remember, where each internal point inside the cube has infinitely many boundary, boundary point objects there. Right? So when you cut it, half of them go to the one part, and the other half go to the other part. Right? And I can't just say two because you might cut it this way and cut it this way. Right? So you need at least four, you can cut it this way, this way, this way. You can cut it continuum many ways, 
So there's got to be continuum any distinct boundary points at each spatial point. So it's really crowded. In addition to all of those, there's also the gunky stuff. Right. Right. Um, now, uh, now let's go back to Brentano. Now he complained that one of the earliest, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in this, I, I wish I knew the history better. What are the precursors to the Dedek and Cantor view? I mean, where do we get that idea? I mean, it's really orthodoxy nowadays, and we're not claiming, Jeffrey aren't claiming that it was a dumb idea, a mistake that the community, I mean, that, you know. Uh, but it seems to have come out of the blue, and, and now everyone buys it. But what were the precursors? Well, one of the precursors to it was Bolzano, right. uh, 1830s, I guess, right? Or, uh, yeah, 1830s, right? Uh, but he wasn't, in his lifetime, wasn't all that well. I and mean, we can't call that a, an influence, because I don't think he was all that influential. But, at least among mathematicians, but uh, certainly the philosophers knew about it. And, and, and he, he had this sort of dedicated canter picture, I meaning obviously he didn't call it that, uh, where uh, space is composed of points, an actual infinity of points, and objects are like that. And so he actually got stuck with Hudson's knot, and he solved it in the, uh, in the way that uh, you know, Hudson would. Right? So, that is, so according to Bolzano, the only way two objects have come into contact is if one is open and the other is closed. Right. Uh, and Brentano said that that's monstrous, that thought. <laughs> so, and, so this is a quote from Brentano. That Bolzano, again, a great mathematician, right, he's not denying that, but was led to his monst monstrous doctrine that there would exist bodies with and without surfaces. Right. You're kind of stuck with that if you sort of take this view. Uh, the one class containing just so many is the other. Because contact would be possible only between what a body with a surface, only between a body with a surface and one without. And that's monstrous, according to Brentano, and so he does all this stuff to make it less monstrous. Namely, gunky stuff, infinitely many, right? right. Uh, now, so apparently it seems to me that, I mean, Bolzano's mon mon monstrous doctrine just is an instance of Hudson's not. And apparently it seems to me monstrosity is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, they both seem pretty, pretty wacky. All right, now, from a region-space perspective, I'll uh, so am I running out of time? Yeah, so, uh, so we'll just, uh, very briefly, that's kind of good, because now I can tell you how it from a region-space perspective, I don't have to get into any detail, but I'm almost out of time. But of course, there is a question period coming, so. All right, now, so let's go think of things from an Aristotelian point of view now, and wonder whether we're still going to get stuck with this same uh, picture. So, from a region-space perspective, an Aristotelian one, that is where all objects are, all spaces, space itself is dumpy, uh, there are points there, but they're just limits, so you don't have to worry about point size things and such. Two objects touch if the, if the regions they occupy are contiguous in Aristotle's sense, if they share a boundary. If they're, boundary, if they're separate objects, if they're contiguous, then their boundaries are together, they're in the same place. And if they're continuous, their boundaries just disappear, but they're sharing them somehow, but the boundaries are in the same place. Uh, Consider, for example, an object A that exactly occupies a cubical region, and another object B that exactly occupies a neighboring cubical region. Um, no distinction between the object being open and closed. That's uh, you know, a, a mistake to even wonder that. Right? Boundaries just are the boundaries of the objects. They're metaphysically tied in. Clearly, A is in contact with B. One side of A is snug against one side of B. If we don't reify the sides of the objects and think of them as somehow separate from the object, then there's less temptation to think that the objects overlap. Um, I'll skip this. Maybe, um, yeah. So this is a good place to stop then, as I said, because A, I'm out of time, and B, you know, because we've sort of gotten to the, uh, so I think I've sort of laid out that, that there are puzzles there, and the puzzles are much easier to negotiate on a Aristotelian picture. I'm not claiming there aren't any other ones, but those are easier to negotiate. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, anyway, so I'll just tell you what I think, yeah. which is a question. Uh, 
um, so, so um, if, if we buy what Brentano says, in, uh, suppose I have a segment and I break it into two parts, yes. what happens is that the, uh, there are two points which used to coincide and they no longer coincide after a break. That's right. Yeah? Yeah. But now if, if they're colored, suppose the left part is white uh, and the right part is yeah. black, it now is uh, I suppose that after breaking, one point is white and one is black, but when they're, they're not broken yet, what yeah. color is that? So it seems to me that Brentano's uh, strategy doesn't work with colors. It doesn't solve, yeah, you're right, I thought of that, that's interesting. So Brentano's strategy does not solve Curse's puzzle. Yeah. Because right. you're wondering what color is the boundary, or what property does the boundary, well, no, sorry, on, on, yeah, that's that's right. The person's puzzle presupposes that we're not in a we're not in a Brentano type of you know. We're assuming that the boundary's got to go with one or the other. Mm -hmm. right. So the puzzle, in effect, presupposes that the boundary belongs to either either the the, the, the circle or the or the or the background. Mm -hmm. right. So and it'll, so it'll have whatever properties one or the other has. The 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 Brentano picture is that it sort of belongs to if it's an interior boundary, it sort of belongs to both. Yeah. yeah. No, I, no, I think I see. I think there would be a real puzzle there. So imagine a, 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 a an object that hasn't been broken yet, and half of it is red, and half of it is 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 is, is or half of it is black, and half of it is, is white. And then you've got the boundary there, and then you could ask what color is the boundary. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And as far as I know, Brentano's solution wouldn't have anything to say to that. And if it did, it would be kind of a weird one, where uh, yeah, half the Half of the well, not half. There's infinitely many, but some of the boundary points are black and some are white. Mm -hmm. right. And if you happen to break it right there, it just so happens all the black ones go this way and all the white ones go this way. <laughs> uh, and my, my question was simply based uh, on the fact that if I remember correctly, you know, uh, Varzi likes bring down solution. And he oh, oh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't he remember did, that. He develops a sort of theory based uh -huh. on coincident boundaries along bring down those lines. So then what would it, and yeah, well, yeah. So I don't know how you would solve the, the that particular yeah, problem. That, yeah. That problem. Yeah. I didn't know that, uh, is this the same uh, article that I was citing? Or I don't, I, I don't know. remember. I read something many years ago. Yeah. I mean, quite often, you know, people will write different things at different times that are sort of inconsistent with each other. But the, <laughs> but the paper that I, I mean, yeah, I do it. You know, we all do it. I mean, that's not criticism. Yeah. Uh, the paper that I was citing, he, I don't think he was, he, he was sort of, he wasn't allowing that the boundaries could coincide. <clears throat> which, uh, well, but that's the object that's already been broken, right? If it hasn't been broken yet, yeah, then what do you make about these sort of internal boundary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think it's discussed in that article. I haven't read everything that Barzi's written, but if you say he does like the Brentano picture? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. yeah, the Brentano chisel one where, in effect, what you have in effect are infinitely many, or at least more than one, potential boundary points internal to the object? Yeah. yeah. And a related, uh, not, I mean, yeah, a related issue I have is how many coincident points are there on a boundary? Uh, it seems to me that the Brentano picture underdetermines that. Uh, so for example, if I have a line, you know, a segment, and I break it, uh, I could say that I have two coincident points there because I could yeah. break it into two parts. That's right. But if I have a circle and I consider all the radiuses, and there are infinitely many radiuses that coincide on the center, yeah. so I will I will need to have at least infinitely, uh, I mean, uncountably many I would points. Think, I would think continuum. Then. Yeah, but the point is why, why continuum many, not more? Oh, not more than that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I should have rephrased. Mm -hmm. At least continue. Man. Yeah, but right. why, why, why not more? Why not more? Right. right. Well, because you don't need more. But mm -hmm. yeah, you don't need more. But right. yeah. that's not right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, don't multiply entities beyond necessity. You know. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, I'm pretty sure that there must be there must be a shift in Barney's views because his actual views on values are that, um, like, in, in the article that I was that I was working with, uh, if you take let's say you take like a cube and you cut it. The picture that he has there is that the knife, when you cut it, will take the boundary of, that's around the cube and stretch it along the inside, and that'll become the boundaries of the of the internal objects. But then you still have a point at the end. Of yeah, the yeah, end. and he notes that that you still have to worry about that because yeah. it's, he calls that a magical moment or something. But that's just one point that he says, okay, you know, 
yeah, you do have that problem because you're changing the topological structure of the thing at some point. Of course. Right. But he says, look, but it's just, if you get it down to one point, that's not so bad. I, I mean, I think, I kind of said it. It's topologically, it's, it's the exact same problem. Yeah. But yeah, that's right. As to what, but he says, yeah, there is that problem with the last point there, but, but he does indicate it, but that's not consistent with that. I mean, that's not the Brentano picture. The Brentano picture is that when you cut it, you're actually taking these internal boundaries and, and splitting them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it may be that in a later paper, he, or, or an earlier one, that this one supersedes. Right. Okay. Um, so that's it. Uh, I would like to ask you just a very question. So it's not clear to me how you understand the Aristotelian picture, and then how, in what sense, is the transference from Suarez. So not that I know anything about it. Well, I don't know much about either one of them, so, right, yeah. <laughs> so, so the blind leading the blind here, right? If I have understood you properly, in the Aristotelian view, uh, in the, Aristotelian view uh, the points are defined in terms of, of segments, so, so limits. Mm -hmm. in, in one dimensions, yeah. And, but, yeah. In, in one dimensional. One dimension, yeah. so in order to uh, get a clearer picture of, of the view, uh, I would like to ask you what happened when I just um, how do you, what's the way that you would I make uh, two segment continues into a in the larger, water. yeah, into a yeah. one, and then I split it again yeah. at exactly the same point. Yeah. Uh, so what, what is the relation yeah. between those right. boundaries, and then how you create and destroy of those entities seems pretty similar to Suarez. So. All right. So and what's happening? Yeah. Okay. That's a good. All right. So yeah. So this is this is what I think the line is. If there's any Aristotle people here, you can correct this. That, so we're starting off with our separate say bring them together, then the two points that were at the endpoints of this one and this one, in effect, disappear. And what we have then is one point that's now exists potentially. So one ex only one point exists potentially? Potentially, right. And all that means is, I mean, it's not like it has any metaphysical status uh, uh, other than it's a place where the line could be divided. That's all that it means to say that the point exists potentially. It's a place where the line could be divided. He's not thinking of it as somehow separate. And then when you, of course, you divide it again at the same point, then you're taking what used to be one potential point and you now get two actual points. And what's the relation between those two points and the ones before the connection? None? Or? Um, what was potential became actual? Right. No, that, that's, that's very clear. That's clear. Uh, yeah, go by two, though, yeah. Uh, and before, yeah. so we have two segments, A and B. Yeah. And I would place it together into C, and then we split it into A prime and B prime. Yeah. So what's so the relation between the, the points of A prime and the point of A? Okay, so A and A prime, one exists actually, one exists only potentially. There is that. Oh, no, you mean... The, no, both oh, exist actually. <coughs> oh, so that was you... you oh, I, I split it again. So I put them together... And put it together, I see. So that's the A and A prime. So A and B, right, they're separate now. Put them together. <coughs> Right, and split it again. Uh, now, so take the, the left end point of A and the left end. Right, um, given that it's the same segment, A and A prime are the same segment, then it would seem to me that it would have to be the same endpoint. Because the endpoints just are, they're metaphysically tied, they're dependent on the, it's just the point of the segment. So if it's the same segment before and after, it's got to be the same, uh, the same endpoint. And you're starting to say, look, it's starting, it's starting to sound kind of Brentano-like. No, because there were one, but I think it's sort of, it, it, he's not thinking of the point as something that is independent of the segment. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so it, it, you don't have to wonder about what, what happens to it. I mean, it, it sort of goes, comes and goes with the segment. So A and A prime, in a sense, are only, so A and A prime are only, but only when, when they're put together, A doesn't exist either anymore. It's just potential. And A prime as well. After the second, after the, the split, then intuitively it seems to me that A and A prime are the same. Now, if we're going to hold that, then presumably the, then their endpoints have to be the same. Does that help or? No, it, yeah. it, it helps, but then how, how is it different from, so could you maybe say something in relation to Schwab, where things appear and disappear, because in this way, so segments appear and disappear. Right. Yeah. Well, because Suarez says the, right, so maybe it's just, <clears throat> there might be a way to read Suarez as an Aristotelian, right? Yeah, maybe, that's, that's right. Maybe, right? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. But then, but then the internal boundaries would only exist potentially, 
And the fact that there's only one, that would actually be rather telling. Right? Right? But, of course, at one point Suarez actually says that, the, that when you divide it, the internal boundary is destroyed. And a new one is... We can translate that into Aristotle talk. You know, that the potential is no longer potential, no actual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not too different from this little scenario I had in the first talk where you sort of reinterpret everything and it comes out it's the same thing, so it's just a verbal dispute. Yeah, I can sort of see how that, you know, how that might go. You'd have to sort of look at everything he has to say and see if we can get it all in there. Right? So if we interpret it to mean destroyed meaning no longer potential, now actual, you know, yeah, that might seem to fit, that might, that would at least bring it closer. Well, it's sort of related to this one. So I have to confess that I have no clear conception of what it would take to uh, merge two, two segments or two such things with mathematical objects. But no, that, that's a, that's an interesting problem. So yeah. I don't know if maybe that's where my worry arises, but uh, I I find it puzzling to. Yeah. So I I see one picture in which the two endpoints become a merely possible one. But yeah. obviously, it doesn't make any sense to say the two things become one. No. So we'd better say that the two things disappear and this other thing comes into existence. Yeah, in the same place, like something like that. Yeah. But it's also I also find it. I mean, I, I if we think of the points just as endpoints, then yeah. it's not too worrying. That, and but that's, on the other that's hand, the crucial move. Right. Okay, so can you yeah. help me like work through this, like the relationship between the two things that go out of existence and this other thing that uh, yeah. the potential thing that starts to be there, and also in relation to the problem of what we yeah. are doing when we... Yeah, so they're not really part, well again, I don't know sort of how we're going to handle the metaphysics, right? So, the points are not really basic <coughs> ontological items, they're, they're metaphysically tied to the thing that it's an object of, and of course, it's, so if the thing doesn't exist, then neither does the, does the endpoint. Right, so, again, so with the example we had here, so we had, we had a segment uh, that by itself, A, right, and we had another one, B, uh, and they have their own endpoints, and then you bring them together, now A and B no longer exist, at least as actual things, so then neither do their endpoints, right? because the points are tied to the object. Now what's there instead is the place where the new thing could be cut. Right? That help, right? or not? Right? Yeah, so we have to say also the segments that they don't, no longer exist when we... Not actually, right? they only exist potentially. So we cannot really we say that they are potential parts of the thing, but they are... Yeah, that, that's actually, I mean, I'm not quite sure that that's right, but, but uh, that's the way it's been put to me by scholars, at least some of them, right? That, that continuous things only have their parts potentially. Right? So if you're thinking of muriology in the contemporary sense, that's sort of Jeffrey and I do, or it's just, you know, there's no, nothing without it mobile there, right? Uh, if you're thinking of the continuous thing as just having parts, right, mm -hmm. then you're not going to get the right picture. I, yeah, the, I, I should also note like, that this reminds me a lot of what Leibniz says about continuous, especially the Ross remark he made about the fact that it doesn't have actual parts but only potential parts. Only potential parts, right. Yeah, it's, it emphasizes this point at all. Probably yeah. also because... Now, people mm -hmm. have put this to me. They're not actually Aristotle scholars in the sense like Sarah Brody is. They're more like logicians who do no more, no more Aristotle than I do. Like Marco Panza is one. And he actually made that line. He said that, that for Aristotle, Continuous things only have their parts potentially, and he used the example of like like a tree limb, right? So, and take like a part of the tree limb. It's only a place where you could cut the tree limb, but it's it's only there potentially. Right? The part is only there potentially, but that that into intuition is I can sort of get my head around. I, I can understand that for tree limbs and blocks of wood or things like that. But think of something else like water, like a body of water. I mean, that's intuitively continuous too, but that doesn't seem to have its part. That seems to be more where you know you want to see no there actually is a you know a part there that's not just a potential part. But again, so I don't know what you know Aristotle may not be uh, be that consistent throughout all this and what sorts of objects he has in mind. It is important that the continuous things as we saw earlier are unities. Now what he means by that, right? But a continuous thing is is a unity. And that also would fit in the idea it only has two points potentially. Now sometimes he talks about what the unity means is if you take if you take part of it and, and move it, the whole thing goes with it. That would apply to the tree limb, but not to the water or even like a wet enough dough or something like that. So I'm not quite sure what to make of these. Right? 
and you are right that, that I'm sort of taking these distinctions and bringing them over into the mathematical realm of whether, when and what to make of them, and it's not quite clear how that's supposed to work either. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that according to that, that you're not going to get a, a distinction in the mathematical realm, in geometry, between things that are merely contiguous and things that are continuous, the way you would in the, you're not going to get an analog of the books. Right, the two books, right? The way the way you will, and right. so again, I'm not quite sure how to sort of sort all that out. Well, what are you thinking? What would the picture be like if you think about higher dimensional spaces? You beyond three? Yeah. Well, three or beyond four. four yeah, yeah, because I mean that means that, for example, we have a surface, and you cut the surface. You can cut it in different ways. You have a space of functions. Yeah. So that space of functions becomes something potential, not actual. That, yeah. And that could happen with yeah, five, five dimensions. So yeah. What's the point of view? Yeah. yeah well, again, the, that's you know this is sort of well beyond anything Aristotle would ever. I'm sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the account that, that Jeffrey and I give, and it's not an Aristotelian one fully, because we're making a lot of play with infinity. But that naturally extends to two dimensions. Well, not so naturally, but with some work, it extends to two dimensions. So from there on out, it doesn't matter from there. But you're not going to get this fully Aristotelian picture there about potential and actual. But the idea would still be that uh, there's no points, right? Or they're not fun. You can always define points as limits. But you're not thinking of this manifold, whatever it is. Uh, not how many dimensions it has. It's just composed of points. One of the puzzles to me, you know, that's going to be not irrelevant to what your question is. So one of the problems from that point of view is to try to make sense of continuous variation. That's in effect where you know why, why, why functions were brought in historically was to try to make sense of continuous variation. And, uh, and there it is really natural to be dealing with points. And it's it's not obvious how to do it, right, on a more gunky framework. You know, I don't know if that helps, but. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so in some of the puzzles you explain presuppose that uh, point size uh, objects can have color. And, uh, and you mentioned that in passing that it's not clear that that yeah, makes good. sense. What the hell does that mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And light, it, uh, light very well can't bounce off of it. Like, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to take a wavelength or something. Right? Yeah. So I was wondering if, if, if points can have some properties that can be used to run that kind of puzzle. Uh, properties that are nothing like color. Something else, I guess, right? You'd have to, and um, yeah, with, in terms of functions, maybe, or something like that, or yeah, I'm not claiming that. Again, yeah, yeah, we're not claiming that 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 that, we, that, that you know the intellectual community made this colossal mistake by bringing points in. It's enormously productive, and in particular, you can handle things like continuous variation. You know, when you're dealing with points, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the question is sort of what. You know, how seriously to take this in, in the sense of metaphysics. Because you can always bring points even into an Aristotelian picture as limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then, in effect, you could talk about a point having a property like a color if it's, say, part of a region that has that color, something like that. Mm -hmm. right. Like a relational property? Yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> if we're thinking of the points as somehow tied to the regions that they're parts of, you know, as Aristotle would, right, then in some sense, it'll have the color because it'll, it'll have color because it or, or properties like color because the region will. Right. But the idea would be, well, what about the point itself, right? As a right. And then it depends on what you know what you want to make of it. Yeah. Anyway, else? Again. So, uh, if we have the opportunity, uh, the last of your slides starting mentioning something that you. It comes to grounding and fundamentality, and then something came to my to my mind. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to ask you. I mean, just to think it's interesting. What would be in this framework of the event? So the segments or those potential yeah, elements when it's a line. Is yeah, that, that, that seems. That's got to be where. Yeah, that's got to be circularity. That's got to be where. If there's going to be any metaphysical action here, it's got to be in that. As to which one's more fundamental. Because if you start out with a gunky space, at least if you if you have infinity in it, you can define points as limits, right? or as endpoints, you know, all of, all of your stuff. Uh, if you start out with um, a pointy space like that in Cantor, right, then you can define regions, all kinds of regions, as certain sets of points. So in particular, uh, if you start with the in Cantor space, and you look at all of the regular open sets in it, right, 
Okay, don't think you'll get a model of our theory. Right? I mean, not Aristotle's, but you know, Jeffrey's in there. All right, so then, then part of me wants to say, this is sort of thing I broached at the beginning and said we wouldn't have time for, uh, that there's just no fact of the matter as to whether space, real space, right, is composed of points or not. Because you can do it either way, right, and translate that forth. If there is going to be an action there, it's going to, probably going to be, or at least if metaphysicians are going to have an act, you know, have anything to say here, it's going to have to do with fundamental fundamentality. Because for the dedicated canter claim, the, what goes along with it is that points are the fundamental thing. And everything else is defined in terms of those. So points are fundamental, reasons are derivative. Uh, or, I don't know, what's the right word? Derivative, is that it? Le less fundamental. Right. Uh, and for uh, the, the gunky theorist, it would be regions that are fundamental, and points would be, would be derivative or less fundamental. If that distinction makes sense, then of course you have a real debate. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, and also uh, um, just simply in your model, uh, points are defined in terms of uh, segments or segments are more. Or fundamental. actually sets of sets of segments, yeah. something like that. Yeah. I mean that's it, it's not unique to us. I mean, why did that? That's an okay. idea. And yeah. then uh, segments are. Oh, I'm not sure whether this is correct, but uh, segments are constituted uh, in those. Uh, those potential points. Ah, no, or they're not. Potential, no, potential no, they're points not. are also defined in terms no. of segments. That's right. So always yeah. segments. Are, yeah. That's no, it's gunky. Right. Yeah. That is, no, it isn't. We're not yeah. thinking. Get clear about this gunky. Yeah. 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 Right. So if you're thinking of, of fundamentality in terms of composition, yeah. right? Yeah. Then then you're just ruling gunky stuff out altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, there isn't any bottom. But if you're taking fundamentality to be more in the sense of sure. We know how we're defining it, or if it's propositions that are more fundamental rather than stuff. Right. Yeah, so if there is an issue there, it's got to be that, right? I kind of think, although I don't have an argument for this yet, that the debate between the an Aristotelian, or not an Aristotelian, but a gunky theorist and a pointy, pointy theorist one is merely verbal. Right? That's what I want to say, or that's what I think I want to say. It seems like a friendly crowd here, I can say this, and right? just take it back there. Uh, right. uh, but then uh, that would mean that, again, given the test for merely verbal excuse, it means you could translate anything from one says to the other. Now, what about the fundamentality stuff? Because they're going to disagree about what's fund fundamental. Right. So if I'm allowed to translate that from one to the other, then I can, I can get the game going. But then, you know, if you're kind of thinking, you know, fundamental is this thing that's not up for grabs in, the, in this verbal dispute, then, then there is a real dispute there. Do you want to ask something unrelated to the talk? Well, you want to talk about anti human structuralism? Oh, oh, the new book. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, at least then yeah, I can't claim that I just forgot. Let's. <laughs> well, probably should talk about that later. Yeah, well, so real numbers aren't numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So how so how how do you handle the real numbers if you're thinking of only as mere possible? Uh, no, you don't. You don't. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have a real. I mean, real analysis is. Yeah, I mean, that's like 16, 17 centuries. No, I'm sorry. So not for Aristotle. But so so if we think, does it mean that the space continuum is just going to be very different in the structure than the real? Or, right? Well, up, you know, up to the idea that we could always tr translate back and forth. Yes, yeah, so if you, you, you normally want to think of a line as a, as a set, right? We can actually embed this is something, you know, the, the helmet and I do. We can sort of take a, our gunky line, you can embed the real numbers in it. Yeah, so I don't as, as regions, not as points, right? Oh, I see. Okay. Right. So, um, you know, so take like a number like pi. Yeah. Right. All right, well, take, obviously you need a unit. So, so pick, a, pick an arbitrary unit, mm -hmm. a, a region, an, an interval, right? The, an, you know, intervals are intuitively what you think they are. Call that one. Then, then sort of take three copies of that. Oh, right. Yeah, that's three. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, to the right. I mean, you got to go. Well, sorry, from your point of view, to the left. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, and then take like you know the point one part of it. You know what you can and put that on 
and then take the point oh four part of that of the original unit, put that on. Right. Now, here's, now here we're going well beyond Aristotelian resources because now we're going to take the division of all of those, mm -hmm. and that'll be you know that'll correspond to pi. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's very helpful. Right. So then we get in effect the positive numbers on the one side, and then the negative numbers that way. Zero is going to be the you know going to be the kicker. That you don't know what to do with that. But you know, because we don't have any point sized parts to, right. to, to, you know, but given that it's just one, we, we just let that be anything other than, you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's part of the, the, my suggestion that, that you, you can really go back and forth between these once you put infinity on the table, you know, in, in, a, in a very un Aristotelian way, you know, an actual infinity. You take an actual infinity of regions and, and fuse them. Mm -hmm. well, you, you can ask any question. Yeah? <laughs> um, no, I was thinking just a, a very quick comment on um, again the the Brentanian solution. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier we were saying that, um, uh, that if I understood correctly, the Brentanian solution is that there is a multiplicity of points coinciding uh, at each spatial point. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and that sounds like a very profligate ontology. Yeah, it sounds monstrous. To so so one one alternative would be to embrace contingent identity and uh -huh. think and think that actually there is one point which will be which will will become two. Yeah, I'm not a friend of contingent identity, but there is a whole legion of yeah, people no, who the, like that. Yeah, no, I, I can sort of see that too. It would be kind of like a um, think of like an amoeba. It's yeah. just an example, right? So it is one, one of even then it splits and it's two. Yeah. And you're not going to wonder, well, which one after the split was, did it, you know, just became two, right? So you can look at it that way. So I, th yeah, I think there are at least two yeah. metaphysical <coughs> packages that are actually consistent with the brain dynamics. So yeah, now, does, does thinking about amoebas uh, involve contingent identity? Uh, I don't know in the case of amoeba, yeah. but... Uh, I mean, if we think of cases like um, the statue and the lump of clay. Sure, yeah, then you get, the, or at least you kind of wonder, maybe it's identical for some purposes yeah. and different for others and things like that. But here it's something that's splitting. So the thought, it was actually Grant, my friend Grant Priest that suggested that, maybe a version of this, that you think of it as like the, the, one, the internal boundary point becomes to when it's split. Follow up or relation with that idea. Uh, what happens uh, with the receptacles, with the status of the receptacles? Mm -hmm. I think on the. What do you mean? What happens? Oh, you mean when? When? Yeah. So, what is the receptacle? Is it, is uh -huh. it the open thing or the closed thing? Yeah. Be because we have points, yeah. and it happens that in some time, or I don't know if there was were time here because. Well, we have to talk about time and space. Sure, and yeah. sure, yeah. it is time. But what happens in the country? Well, with the statues of receptacles, but because receptacles are, are chunks of the space that an object can exactly occupy. That's right. Okay, That's but the official if the space is com is uh, well, we think the time and space has points. As composed of points. And yes. points have 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 time as a dimension. Then what happens with the that dimension in in receptacles? I think I don't oh, have any idea. Oh, about I that. see. Yeah. So if you do it three, if you do it four dimensionally or something like that, right. yeah, I don't know. I, again, I'm not a metaphysician, so you know, I'm not gonna, how does it work really? Well, yeah. My, my point uh, after that, yeah. because I see some things uh, similar to this opinion. Uh -huh. Uh, but maybe I can uh, send you by email. Yeah, are you is worried that, about like endurance and perdurance and issues like that? Is that is that in the same area here? Sorry? Are you worried about issues of endurance? No, I, I would, would say that sometimes we put some physical things in our mathematical ideas, yeah. and sometimes we don't. Yeah. And this creates a lot, a lot of problems, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Here is one, another okay. one is like for example, with the idea of continuity, or the idea between relations with boundaries, mm -hmm. when we broke something, for yeah. example, obviously we think not only in two boundaries, but with three, because what uh, happens with the broken thing 
or something like that. Maybe that, so you, like that's you take like you take like a base and you, and you hit it, break it up in all these pieces, or you break it break only it. like that, or what? Yeah, or just say just break it into two pieces. Okay. Then you say what? There's a third thing. Yeah. There's what the original base and then the two pieces afterwards. Yeah. Uh, before and after that. Yeah. So before you had the potential part, we like to put it in here as the terms. Thank you.